we can just start um, by saying happy Pride Month, June 1st, Gemini season, Pride Month. I'm a Gemini and I'm gay. And I think I'm double both of those things because of the confluence, you know? Um, and that as long with happy Pride Month, it's important all the time, but especially as going right now to say Black Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matter, we need to defund the police. And um, so much of Pride is sort of its history is like an intersection of these things. Um, Pride was started by anti-police protests after police um, aggression against gay communities and it was led by um, black and brown trans people. Um, so we have an important reminder that our oppressions are always interlocked and overlapping, but unfortunately our liberation is not, which is why um, cis white, white gay people are so much the face of and the voice of and the community that's pandered to by companies during Pride Month. And that's of course always been inadequate, but it's really being thrown into stark relief right now um, with the pandemic of racism and police violence happening in our country. Do you want to say anything else, Eugene? Yeah. You said it, that was great. We also, you know, also, whatever, we can also do this, say their names, but like George Floyd, uh, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, um, I'm going to say her name wrong, Sandra Bland, um, every, the complete, like, list of lives that are lost every year to police violence, even if it's a pandemic when policing itself has gone down so much and um, rates of killings by police have remained pretty consistent. So that's not what our thing is mostly about today, but it's important to, I think, foreground <laughs> and just acknowledge what's going on. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that right when everything's reopening, we do go back to the same thing that we've been doing before the pandemic, so. We'll talk about this more in a second, but also that like, even when we were all closed, black and brown people are still more most affected in the, by the pandemic. So be as it may, moving on, uh, it's important to launch that and happy pride if you can be happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're here week 10. I'm Eugene. Is him pronouns. Oh, and I'm Thomas. And I use he and they pronouns. I mean, Eugene are both UCSB people. Yeah, we are. Um, and so this week, uh, the title is One Way or Another, One Day Will All Wear Masks, Mutual Rage and Mutual Aid. Uh, and we are trying to think of how to process everything that's been happening and really um, put everything we've been doing together in one way. And this is the best way that we've found to do so and hope that it is beneficial to you in your classrooms. Uh, we also acknowledge that we have been at about zero capacity to do this presentation. So we had grand ideas for it and I think we are ending on a note that we wish we could do a little bit more, but. That's reflective of whatever. But. Yeah. So this is, um, that quote is from uh, Crime Think, which is this like anarchist um, collective that publishes some very cool things. And I'm probably on a list because <laughs> I've been reading their stuff. Um, but it's, um, as you'll see, the, the graphic on the left is from Hong Kong protests and um, uh, was originally started by their Brazilian um, like groups uh, in response to some violence um, that has been happening in Brazil. So I think it just, I mean, it's, it's so stark and so poignant in this current moment. Um, that's really where we're drawing the, the idea for this week on. Um, so we're wanting to start by thinking about what we've covered so far in our strike syllabus um, through the nine weeks. Um, so really we began and this whole project was because of the cost of living adjustment COLA movement that was in the UC system. Um, so we started talking about history, relation to COVID-19, the move to online education, went and talked about the housing crisis, how that pairs with the UC system master plan for higher education, talked about austerity measures generally, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, and how that affects the UC. Um, and as we keep um, talking about, will affect the UC in the future. Um, talked generally about neoliberalism, disaster capitalism, Thomas's favorite person in the world, Naomi Klein. Um, we talked about the history of May Day and types of direct action that people could participate in. Um, we also did histories of union organizing with special attention to issues of race that Thomas was bringing up and was excellent. We then did a history of UC student activism from World War II to Occupy until now. We also compared pandemics um, 
through the history of the AIDS crisis. So since COVID has been talked about a lot with the AIDS pandemic and with the 1918 in, uh, influenza, wanted to kind of show how those are interrelated and how they're not. Um, we also last week uh, talked about surveillance during times of crisis and the ways that racism collides with surveillance and profit seeking measures of tech companies during COVID, which is very like historical, but also very contemporary. And this is like maybe a broader version of what we were doing, which I think was clear to us from the start, but maybe, I don't know what this looks like as a list. Um, but we obviously were involved with COLA and the kind of specific demand we had was for a cost of living adjustment. But the kind of broader vision we had was a world in which um, many things are different. Um, we were kind of talking about um, pay and justice and the ability to sort of live fully cared for lives. Um, and so these were other topics that even though they were, we would sometimes like them to COLA, even if they weren't directly in that kind of sphere of things, it's really the vision of the kind of things that were going on in the world that we, and I think the broader COLA movement are invested in seeing changed. We also want to give some updates. So things have changed since our past presentations um, regarding the uh, AIDS crisis. Larry Kramer passed away, it was last week, I think. Um, yeah, he was an author, playwright, activist, and the founder of ACT UP and one of the founders of Gay Men's Health Crisis, a GMHC in New York City. Um, very influential um, in the AIDS epidemic. Um, also, thing, when we talk about disaster capitalism, uh, we have two examples from the last week uh, in Canada and Australia. In Canada, Alberta's energy minister, Sonia Savage said, now is a great time to be building a pipeline because you can't have protests of more than 15 people. Uh, the reason she says this is that Canadians need jobs. And uh, as we've shown this past week, that is people can still protest in groups of more than 15. Uh, they will just be attacked by a militarized police. Um, Trudeau's also, what a name to have, Savage, and also be like, a yeah. name destroyer of the environment, anyways. <laughs> um, sometimes art imitates life, I guess. Uh, Trudeau's government bought this Trans Mountain Expansion Pack project for three, three and a half billion American US dollars, um, which is a, a, a pipeline that they're trying to design from the Alberta sands to the Pacific coast. The Rio Tinto company in Western Australia destroyed a 46,000 year old Aboriginal cave, uh, system of caves, which was allowed under current Australian legislation and Pride Choices mining operations, um, which have a history of trying to protect the Aboriginal uh, artifacts, but actually is very much allowing um, the interests of mining operations to take over. Um, in talking about racism and surveillance last week, uh, protests have erupted throughout the country, actually worldwide, um, over the murder of George Floyd. Um, and um, the US legislature it has a bill that's just blat blatant racism called the Secure Campus Act, which is barring Chinese nationalists from receiving graduate or postgraduate student or research visas in STEM fields. And I think um, President Trump just um, made like an executive order about this today. So it's very much happening. Um, and also let's talk about austerity measures that we've discussed. The lack of healthcare funding and PPE um, has been documented, but they're an exorbitant amount of finances for militarized police force that we have seen during these protests. And to take LA as an example, um, the amount of budget that the city of LA is allocating to the LAPD is astronomical and so wild. Places funds ain't getting cut in austerity measures, just like everything nope. else. If anything, they'll use this to increase their police budgets. Um, uh, the focus for mutual rage, um, the way I'm taking it, has been to, in the past few weeks, kind of collect information about how, um, what companies are doing that are benefiting from this time of crisis, um, and what I'm calling pandemic economics. Um, and I will say that I pretend that I don't do economics, but apparently I kind of do, which is so silly. Um, but, the, but there's an economic term called the marginal propensity to consume, where each additional dollar a person would get, um, they have a ratio of what they would save and what they would spend. And studies have shown that each additional dollar that goes to a poor person is comparatively more valuable than dollar going to a wealthy person, because that money goes directly into an economy. 
It is spent more regularly. It is stimulating um, economic growth. While money that goes to a wealthy person ends up going to a bank account, being stagnant. Um, and a quote from researchers that, were, that have done one of these studies is that fiscal stimulus targeted toward individuals in the bottom half of the wealth distribution would be two to three times more effective than just a blanket stimulus. Um, a note that American billionaires have gotten $434 billion richer during the pandemics, and that 600 US billionaires saw wealth growth from just under to three billion, three billion or three trillion to three point four trillion dollars in just two months. Um, so when they're saying that like we're having an economic slowdown, it is hurting people. It's actually just hurting the working class. It is hurting poor people. Rich, wealthy people are doing just fine. Um, Except for Kylie Jenner, who was recently revealed to be lying about being a billionaire, which I think is one victory in that category. But we can. <laughs> That is a good victory. Um, it, it has shown that small business earnings are down um, as much as 40%, while corporate conglomerates are earning record highs. So what this pandemic has done has shifted wealth from small businesses to large ones who could operate during a pandemic, who had the infrastructure to kind of absorb these losses and shift their focus. Um, one thing that is important to note is wage theft. So people often, I think, hear wage theft as like what employees are doing to employers. But in fact, it's classified as what businesses steal from employees. This takes a form of minimum of violations in terms of minimum wage, overtime, rest break, or off the clock violations. And a 2017 survey showed that in the 10 most populous US states, um, 2.4 million workers lost $8 billion annually or $3,300 per year, which I know if <laughs> in any job that I've ever had, if I lost $3,300 a year, that would be huge. That's like multiple Wait, month rent. What is 3,000? I've never seen that number in my money before. Only like 1,000. Yeah, yep. that's more than one month's paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> um, a common thing that keeps happening is that workers don't want to go back to work after receiving unemployment benefits. And what that means is that people are getting paid too little for the work that they are doing. It's like full stop, that's what that means. Um, when thinking about economics, we also want to harken back to the 2008 financial crisis that we've talked about. And the Federal Reserve is responsible for kind of injecting money into the US economy, willy nilly at this point. Um, and in the 2008 crisis, they bailed out money markets, funds, and short-term lending markets for corporations and financial institutions. What happened was that the economy is kind of stuck. It wasn't letting them kind of float on this financial bubble that they've been used to. The same thing after, happened this year, which shows that the, this unregulated market economy that neoliberalists really love to um, talk about doesn't have any oversight and fails left to its own devices. Um, and we didn't learn anything after the 2008 uh, recession. Um, currently, though, the difference is that the Fed is buying junk bonds and backstopping the riskiest markets in the world, which these markets are owned by like hedge fund managers and the wealthy elites, not working class or middle class uh, Americans. Now, perhaps it's not fair to blame the Fed for this. They are financial powers and they don't actually do anything to help individual people. They help like corporations and the, the economy. Um, but what this is doing is training investors that they can just um, rely on the Fed to bail them out um, without actually having to do anything like job creation or pay workers a decent salary. And Congress has been reluctant to actually pass any legislation or oversight on these, um, these financial markets. And in fact, they are like incentivized not to, which is not surprising to anybody. <laughs> um, there's been no mon oversight to money borrowing and that in this current um, bailout, there is no strings attached to money that they're getting from the federal government. They have to make every reasonable um, account to rehire people or pay people money for their fur being furloughed. But they actually don't have to, um, which seems terrible. Some more numbers that I can yell at you. Um, in 2018, 50 US CEOs took home over a thousand times the pay that went to a typical worker in their corporations. So not even the lowest, just like medium. 
um, and in 2019, companies in the S&P 500 stock index spent $2 trillion on buy stock buybacks, which stock buybacks are when a company uses its like um, profits to buy, um, buy shares back for itself to then redistribute that money to shareholders or that go into a bank account. Um, these buybacks do not actually go to employees who are not like C-suite level or um, corporate execs. Um, currently, as we see, employees continue to be faced with the decision to return to unsafe work conditions as we are opening up um, or stay home and lose unemployment benefits. And this hasn't changed in the past month. Um, and just yesterday, uh, or Saturday, I think it was, Mayor Garcetti of LA uh, closed every COVID-19 testing center uh, by saying, we're not going to stand for the burning of police cars. Um, so he's trash. I'm sure Thomas doesn't, doesn't have anything nice to say about him either. <laughs> um, part of this, I also wanted to kind of create a laundry list of companies that have been uh, outwardly benefiting from the pandemic. Uh, this is not exhaustive. This is, doesn't include every company in the, that, I, that exists, but these are the ones that I found. Um, at and retiring CEO Randall Stevenson is getting a $64 million pension, which is like $200,000 a month for the rest of his life. Um, he endorsed Trump's 2017 tax, corporate tax cut, which earned at and $42 billion. And since the tax cut has cut 23,000 jobs. So not creating any jobs, just taking money for himself. Amazon ended the $2 an hour hero pay. Um, while Jeff Bezos saw his wealth increase by 35 billion in two months. Um, and this is the same with Whole Foods, which Amazon owns. Kroger ended their $2 an hour hero pay um, and asked for uh, $461 um, that was overpaid to employees to be paid back. Because of union leadership, they backtracked on this and went, oh, sorry, never mind. Um, and they claim that they've spent $700 million to deal with the pandemic, the amount that they paid for advertising in 2018, um, yet they net $1.7 billion profits in 2019. Goldman Sachs, the CEO, received a 20% raise um, to $27.5 million, and they received $10 billion in buy -it bailouts in 2008. So they seem to be doing fine. Thanks. Thanks for that. And the Hilton, Hilton Hotels have used their money to buy a $2 billion stock buyback on March 3rd. So while their hotels sit empty and they do nothing for the houseless population, they are um, using stock buybacks to kind of pay their, their CEOs more money. The National Mining Association, which is a trade group representing the biggest coal operators, has been asking to rescind $220 million tax increase that was supposed to benefit 25,700 disabled coal miners and their dependents because of black lung disease. So rather than getting a bailout, they're just trying to stop tax increases so that they can stop paying people who have gotten um, a, con a congenital disease because of working in these conditions. Tesla, um, Elon Musk received $700 million bonus while furloughing 11,000 employees, requiring pay cuts for all employees. He doesn't need a pay cut because he receives no salary. So that's one way that these like corporate elites get past salary benchmarks because they don't actually have receive salaries. Um, they get bonuses or stock options. JC Penney, uh, $9.9 million were awarded to executive owned management to retain and motivate these officers um, through an uncertain environment while they've been closing stores and running toward bankruptcy. And Disney um, used one and a half billion dollars to give executive bonuses while cutting the pay of 100,000 workers furloughing and furloughing other workers. Um, the CEO, Bob Chapek, uh, is paid 173 times the median Disney worker, which seems wild. Here's a list as well of whistleblowers who were fired during COVID-19. Um, so Adam Wick is a New Jersey nurse, one of many medical staff fired for going public with workplace concerns, uh, as was Dr. Ming Lin, uh, who was criticizing the Bellingham Washington Hospital for their response and precautions 
Kenisa Barkai is a Detroit nurse, also was fired for speaking out on staffing ratios and poor conditions at her hospital. Christian Smalls is an Amazon worker, fired after organizing a strike to get Amazon to provide paid sick leave to workers and temporarily shut down warehouses that have had COVID-19 cases for deep cleaning. Um, and as reports and surveys have shown, a, major a large amount of cases from COVID have been because of workplace um, not reporting, people getting infected that way. Emily Cunningham and Marin Costa, Costa also were fired from Amazon for circulating petitions about health risks in warehouses and for being part of warehouse activism. And Captain Brett Crozier was fired after leaking a letter to Navy leaders criticizing the handling of the coronavirus outbreak on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. I believe he pronounces it Crozier, which Crozier. is good to know anyways, but also was the name of a lawyer on The Good Wife played by Meryl Streep's daughter, Nancy Crozier. So that's where really, really landed for me. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. Um, that basically ends my rant. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you sitting with me while I just have had all that pent up energy about CEO pay. Um, but through this, we kind of talked about mutual aid and, and a, a sticking point almost every week we've been pointing to group like grassroots groups and organizing that have been the actual heroes quote unquote of this pandemic and have used the skills that they've accrued for years and years of doing this kind of work to keep us afloat. Um, Peter Kropotkin, um, an anarchist from the turn of the 20th century, uh, had a quote, practicing mutual aid is the surest means of forgiving each other and to all the greatest safety, the best guarantee of existence. Cindy Milstein from Mutual Aid Disaster Reef Org said, when we engage in mutual aid, we are gifting each other the beginnings of a new world premised on reciprocal, voluntaristic, and egalitarian social relations. We're collectively self-determining, self-organizing, and starting to self-govern how to supply each other with what we need as well as desire, all the while cultivating beloved communities of care. So mutual aid in this way is recognizing that the ways to address community safety and support have come from communities for a long time. And any kind of government policy should follow from this model. A few things. Thank you, Eugene, for setting that up and for all the work you did this week. Eugene did so much more than me this week and did a ton of stuff. And it was great. I will say, not to undo the whole thing, but I think not calling those slides pan-economics or like some kind of horrible amalgamation of the realm of opportunity. Good as it may, talking a little more about mutual aid. Um, another consistent theme that we brought up in our presentations, it's important how we talked about a lot of the big picture things we talked about have been race and racism, especially in the US, and the way those intersect with things like union organizing, surveillance, um, the housing crisis in California, um, and all kinds of, men or obviously, um, COVID um, infection and death rates. But this has been a thing we've talked on a lot and it's just as important this week in talking about mutual aid. Um, and it's important to kind of start or very early on acknowledge this history of mutual aid because it's something that we think of now or that it's happening um, as a kind of framed often as like a progressive politics thing. And it's important to remember the first, or to know, remember, I don't think a lot of us do this, I didn't until this weekend, um, that the first mutual aid efforts in the US date to the 18th century and were founded by black and immigrant, immigrant groups. And these kinds of coalitions or efforts came out of a shared um, kind of recognition that official institutions were not um, always welcoming or accessible to free black people in the US or um, to immigrant communities who faced varying levels of racism and racialization. Um, and so they turned to these community solutions um, to get be able to raise funds, support themselves, sustain themselves when things like bank loans um, were not a reality. And I was actually surprised to think about this in relation to what you just talked about, but it turns out like a lot of um, corporations and institutions don't actually care about helping people and are not the best way to move forward. So um, this is something that uh, obviously um, black people and immigrants were acutely aware of early in America's history. It's something that is true as, as, as true today. Um, I want to just give a little bit of more context for thinking about what mutual aid is and before I talk about where it's happening right now. This is from a website I'll link in another slide, um, Big Door Brigade, but the mutual aid is when people get together to meet each other's basic survival needs with a shared understanding that the systems we live under right now are not meeting our needs and we can do it together. 
Mutual aid projects are a form of political participation in which people take responsibility for caring for one another and changing political conditions, not just through symbolic acts of putting pressure on their representatives, but by actually building new social relations that are more survivable, kind of like Eugene was indicating, as far as like policy should be coming from these kinds of things. And most mutual aid projects are volunteer based, with people jumping in to participate because they want to change what is going on right now, not ways to convince corporations or politicians to do the right thing. And that is um, important to think about as far as what mutual aid means anyways. And I think it's especially important right now because a lot of people who have been involved with mutual aid for years uh, have been getting a lot of attention recently with COVID for their efforts. And a point that they've been making, and I'll again link this article on one of the slide notes, um, is that mutual aid has existed for a long time. And it's a political project that exists not only during times of pandemic because certain communities are um, in conditions where they are in, experiencing crises or um, kind of more dire situations uh, and it, even under kind of normal circumstances. So it's not just um, about caring for each other in times of like immediate crisis, but about building a new kind of political future and building new systems and recognizing and critiquing the failures of the system around us, which distinguish it um, from charity, which is something that also gets conflated with or confused for, um, because charity is so much, especially like in R and like the whatever, modern Western society, whatever, that like Europe and America, um, so much top down and so much um, a kind of moral positioning that allows a sort of charitable partner to be, um, get some kind of elevated status from their whatever. And they're usually rich. Um, often in our society, they're happening through nonprofits, which um, can sometimes, not always, but sometimes hoard a lot of the money they're received through grants and distribute it in ways that do not necessarily meet the needs of the community they're involved in. This is like probably TMI. But I had a friend who got um, a job recently at a nonprofit as a, um, in a position kind of helping with funds. And it was their first time working in this kind of setting. And they were finding that the place that they were working for was making claims about the services they offer that did not reflect the reality of what they ended up doing and a way to just sort of keep afloat with their head going. And it was like crazy to hear about and like to, for them to experience firsthand anyways. But even more to think that this is not an atypical kind of thing. It's certainly not happening everywhere. Um, but this kind of corruption happens, and it's all again happening under this framework of charity. So that's why mutual aid is such a specific thing, something happening that should be recognized outside the kind of concept, after the, con the context of charity. Also, when we're talking about the like intersection of charity and big business, if like you know how most grocery stores you can donate like Roundup or donate money, that all gets used in um, not that corporations pay many too much taxes anyway, but they use that as a as a to get money off of their taxes as like charitable donations. So it's not that you're doing it, it's that the corporation is doing it for you. Also not to keep babbling about this, but like also like um, charity is seen as like an extra. It's like something we're doing on top of, like we don't have to do this, this is like a guy. And mutual aid is something that is like, we're sort of all invested in and involved in um, out of okay. kind of a mutual respect. So a lot of blah, blah, blah about mutual aid, we go to the next slide. Let's just talk about the fact that it's happening right now um, and it's important always uh, kind of even more acutely so during COVID, but even now, I'm not sure exactly how the model of mutual aid uh, fits with a sort of protest happening right now, anti-police protests, but this is another way of uh, just thinking about resources and places to be devoting our energy, not to speak bad about God and church or whatever, but um, I love COLA, but it's been really hard to kind of devote my energies and mental like capacity in that direction just because of what's going on in the world. So I wanted to put together this list of things kind of going on where we can maybe also to be directing our resources, especially if summer comes up, if we have different kinds of capacities. Um, there's NYC Black Mutual Aid, that's a link to a Twitter account um, where they kind of list resources and things happening in New York. It's New York specific, but I think an interesting model and something to be aware of. Um, USA COVID-19 Mutual Aid, it looks kind of janky, but it's a neat website where they have like a map um, with pins and they put, people can pin offers, like asks or offers onto the pins. So you, you'll have little highlights and you can look in those Google Docs or other kinds of links that are can help you kind of find places stuff in your area or in an area you care about, you think is important to devote to. So that's another resource. Um, Vox had a piece recently with coronavirus volunteering, kind of outlining the different contours of um, not just mutual aid, but also donations and all kinds of things um, with some links that was good. Rolling Stone had a more immediate um, or more recent piece about where to donate to support protesters, which include um, the Black Visions Collective, which all of us probably have heard of, but a lot of other lists as well, along with some queer specific groups that are involved in um, bail collection. So these are all just things I need to be aware of. And I mean, like, we're not, we don't have a lot of money. That's the kind of premise of COLA, but I think especially, um, and this is very different person to person, but like myself personally, getting some money from the CARES Act through my school 
I feel very like comfortable and ready to redirect a lot of that money to some of these funds. And I think that's something we can be thinking about. Um, so we can encourage our colleagues to do if they're in a position to do that comfortably. Um, Big Door Brigade is another great mutual aid kind of reference website. They give some definitions of what mutual aid is and situate its politics a little bit and also kind of like the map, um, give some outlines of toolkits and things you can contribute to. This is, I think, very, very campus to campus, but COLA, I already talked about, I don't care about COLA anymore, but um, COLA does have social welfare campaigns that are going on um, that are kind of campus specific. And I think that I, I can't speak to other campuses other than Santa Barbara, as I know ours is a pretty low capacity right now in terms of bodies. So they're always, I think, looking for people to sign up. Um, even more, maybe locally or immediately, like Eugene and I are both in our campuses. Um, well, Eugene's like one of the daddies of it. I'm just a member of QTGSU, um, Q, the Queer Transgressing Union. Um, I don't know, we're sort of doing things right now putting together care packages um, to Black grad students who um, are expressing like need or interest in that. And I know um, API GSA, the American Asian Pacific Islander um, group is also doing that. Some others are well are as well. So there are things going on. It's going to be very organic. Um, normally I would talk about the history or some shit, but I don't have anything. Just like I think we should really be doing these things to the best that we can um, because we are like very much both in the US but also globally like living through the rise of like ethno-nationalist, um, fascist governments. I'm like thinking of like Hong Kong right now a lot too. So um, I think it's really important, and I, we didn't foreground this as much as we could have maybe in the previous weeks, but just the ways in which people power have been the engine through which so much support and care and survival has happened, and it's something we really, I think, need to be, I mean, it's so hard for me, you know, this with like TAing and doing COLA stuff has been such a drain on time, and so I cannot wait for two weeks from now when these things kind of evaporate, and I can give more of myself to these things, but I just think it is really important and empowering and something we should all be mindful of. So this wasn't really, I didn't have any information, just a lot of yelling, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Eugene. No, that was, that was really great. And I think that these are all important um, discussions and designations. Um, in terms of thinking about mutual aid right now, Thomas, a lot of like prison abolitionist and um, police ref like abolitionist discussion is around mutual aid and community collectives. That if our money could go into alternative programs than just militarizing the police. We could get people in mental health crises, help that they need. Um, think about all of the um, deaths of people going through mental health crisis that the police just shoot, um, rather than actually rehabilitating people or helping people along. Um, I think that mutual aid does give us this like collective way forward. And I totally agree with Thomas that our one of our sticking points has been that it's people power that makes um, the world work in the the ways that we all want it to, and in the um, the the best ways of all of us. And I think that and like and to really to a final point, that's what you're talking about about the kind of groups and like experiences that James is talking about as like um, often having their needs their needs met the least by like police funding. Also, don't get those needs met through charity. So it's just. Um, I'm like very panicky and uh, thank yep. you for anything on there, yeah. Yeah, so next week as to, of every single week, don't be, uh, be anti-racist and don't be terrible. That is what is important. Check in, like check in with what your black friends and colleagues um, are needing or feeling, what you can do for them. And this is like such a different kind of relationship I realized, but even this week I just email my students and ask, what can I do for you this week in the last week of quarter? And the outpouring, like the response has been like, frankly, the most local they've been, and I'm like very happy to be able to do that. So checking in, even if you can't donate, just whatever you can give, I think is great. And um, thank you for following us along for 10 weeks. Yeah, this has been, <laughs> I, I can't speak for Thomas, this has been uh, a great journey. I've learned a lot, um, done too much work, and it's been okay. <laughs> yeah, and I also think, and like, this is not the same kind of thing at all, but even like Strike University, the kind of model of like a public and like accessible and open, Kind of platform for education and things it's just a different kind of um work but still in this vein of like we can make things together we don't actually need a chancellor or a dean or um, a department head um yeah to kind of create the education we want so yeah. thanks everyone we'll see you sometime yeah, you never, oh, although are you going to do anything over the summer talk about are you do, so just a couple things as far as like my mind is very much about austerity stuff right now and like what that's going to look like in the next couple of months. So yeah. I'm going to start like a budget, budget and financial report kind of reading group thing, which I don't know if that'll happen, but are you doing a surveillance thing or something? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get some, uh, some funding 
to do uh, surveillance stuff uh, around the world to see how that's like impacting communities with COVID. So um, hoping that comes through. Uh, and even if it doesn't, that's kind of my dissertation research. So I'll be doing that in some capacity. So yeah. Summer at Strike U is continuing to be grumpy and working for mutual aid. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone.